Before I start, I want to show you something that I've been doing in the last years with business people around the world. So, um, and that's actually something very special for me because most of the things I learned in India. So, I want you to take away everything, put your feet on the floor and close your eyes. And then take three very deep breaths. Deeply in through your nose and out through your mouth and sigh it out. <sighs> One more time, deeply in through your nose, out through your mouth. <sighs> One more time. <sighs> And now just observe, how does that feel? And then observe, like, your feet on the floor. Observe the areas of your body that touch the chair. And go inside. How do you feel like? right now in this present moment. Are you happy? Are you tired? Are you bored? Are you excited? Check in with yourself. And what else is there? Is there any body part that you feel more intensive right now? Is something tense? Sometimes the shoulders are really tense. Just observe. And then slowly open your eyes again. Welcome back again. The exercise, so in business language, we call this mindful meeting. You would maybe call it just a short meditation. And um, one of the things that I really like about that, and there's obviously a lot of studies about it, is when you enter a room, part of you is still not here yet. We are still outside. So just centering ourselves and just focusing on... I'm sitting here, I'm breathing, maybe what's going on. It's just a really nice way of bringing ourselves back into the room. And there's a really interesting study saying even that people make different decisions when they are fully there. So we call that mindful meetings. Before I go deeper into mindfulness and compassion for business, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my childhood. So this is me. I think I was six years back then. Um, my father was a typical guest worker in Germany. So he, my parents are both from Tunisia. And when Germany started to build up after the war, they uh, wanted to have workers who actually do the jobs the Germans didn't want to do. And my father was just playing on the streets and there was this truck saying, who wants to go to Germany? Uh, just jump on and come with us. So that's what he did at the age of 16. He came to Germany, worked there for a few years, and then one day he wanted to marry, so he went back to Tunisia chose my mom and um, he really chose her because it was a like traditional arranged marriage. And my mom um, came to him with him to Germany. So that's kind of how uh, their life in Germany started. My mom, uh, a few years later, uh, decided to leave my father against all traditional odds um, and um, yeah, raised three kids by herself. 
Uh, we did not really have a lot of money and at the beginning it was really hard. We had to wear like clothes of other people and really had to struggle with what we had. But what I still remember is I was a really happy kid. And um, we did not have a lot, but it didn't really matter to me. Back in Germany, I was like, here in India, it's really interesting for me. I think that's one of the reasons why I love being here. Everyone thinks I'm Indian. <laughs> and everyone is like, you know, treats me like I'm one of them. In Germany, that's not the case. Uh, because I just look different. And very early in childhood, I noticed, you know, people, um, when they see differences, it's something that stands out for them. So they asked me all the time, like, where are you from? And um, so I recognized, okay, I'm not like them. I also had a really strange name for them. Munira is not a very German name. So my mom started calling me Muni, which is a very German name, um, just for the people to be able to pronounce it. And um, another thing was, so when I went back to Tunisia, everyone said, oh yeah, you are the German. So I was like, who am I? Also another thing I learned in India, the answer for that and also the meditation on that. But it was really interesting because I didn't know who I was. I wasn't really German, I wasn't really Tunisian. So I figured for myself, you know what? I can just choose who I am. If I'm none of them, I can just take the best out of both countries and just make my own identity. And so two of the things that really struck with me um, were <laughs> you want to click it? Yeah, another thing, I, another really nice sentence I learned in India, same, same, but different. So I was like, everyone is kind of the same, but we are still different as humans. And I also learned money doesn't make me happy. Because I still remember the happiest times in my childhood, we did not have anything. Um, we sat on the floor and ate our food as a family, and I was so happy. So keeping that in mind, I started my business life. And, you know, slowly, slowly you start with business, and when you come out of university, you really want to do a lot of things. And you're really motivated, and then one of a sudden, you kind of start being part of that world, and you feel like, What's going on here? You know, you feel like there's a lot of politics going on, there's a lot of hierarchy, and you feel like, why is this? You know, and you feel like you, the business world kind of changes the way you are as a human being. And um, so I had a lot of questions. And one of the questions was, what would the business like look like? Um, if we would have success and happiness at the same time, but also contribute to something that is higher than just making money. And what if our business world would change? Because I really strongly believe our business world can make an impact, not only for peace, but for all these you know, societal things that we have in this world that need us to change. And also for politics, you know, and business is the money and that's why there's a lot of power in this world. And the question is really like, what can we do there? And um, a really interesting thing is, you know, it's also getting faster and faster. And when you, especially the students out there, when you will start going out doing whatever you will be doing, you will recognize that the world is getting much faster and it's changing also much faster. So actually, you need different strategies to tackle that. And one thing that I learned is stopping, calming down is actually the thing that you need to do when it's getting faster. And also looking into the inside. Obviously there's so much going on outside, not only on the internet, but in general, there's so much happening in the world and we are aware of so many things. We know what's not only happening in our country, but we know what's happening across the world. And one of the things that, that for me in business is like one of my mantras is change from the inside inspires change outside. 
You could also say it in different words, in, in Gandhi's words, who said, be yourself the change you wish. It's basically the same principle. It's about how can I judge anyone else about not being peaceful or not being friendly if I'm not all enhancing this, if I'm not integrating all these principles in my life, if not everything that I say is peaceful, you know, it's like, or non-violent, if not everything that I do contributes to that. So the first thing, even like you know, sometimes when we want to change something, we look outside and we say, okay, what are the things we need to fix? There's so much out there to fix. One of the things for me is I have to fix myself first. I have to really understand what does it mean? You know, what is the change that I wish? And when, if, if one of the changes that I wish is that everyone loves each other and respects each other the way we are, can I say that about myself? And I, you know, my very honest answer is no, I don't love everyone. You know, I wish one day I could, but I don't. And some people disturb me or annoy me. And I wish it would be different, but it's not. At least not right now. But I'm not going to stop to change it. I'm not going to stop to work on changing that. And, uh, and in the business world, this is one of the things that we kind of want to try to see. So what is going on within yourself? Because what is really interesting, what I found out, I have a technique that helps me at least not to react in the same way anymore. And this is mindfulness. So mindfulness is a technique that helped me with this. And I, with mindfulness, um, a lot of people mean a lot of things. One, one technique for mindfulness is meditation, classical meditations. And we all know this is like, you know, this is the country where these teachings come from. I've learned so many things about that. All my teachers are from India and are Indian people. And I've learned a lot about that. For me, it's meditation, but also many more things. And meditation is a tool for me to practice that. It's also going out of autopilot and being really present with what I do, what kind of person I want to be, what kind of values I have, and how I bring this into action. And um, one really nice quote is, um, it describes this quite a lot. It's called, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in this space lies our freedom to grow and react. So f when I heard this first time, I was like, I don't get this. What does it mean? Everyone was talking about this so highly, but I didn't get it. But then I started with my meditation practice and I understood the next time I would have a conversation with someone who would usually annoy me like hell, I understood, oh, all of a sudden, because I learned how to observe the things, I could step back and say, what would be the answer I would want to give if I would be fully connected to myself, to my values, and if I would be fully connected to the person I want to be? I think I wouldn't scream. I would also not use any violent communication. I would be friendly, but still tell the person what I feel. But I cannot do this when I'm full of emotions and I'm angry. And I understood that mindfulness actually helped me exactly to go out of that reactive space. So in, instead of reacting and just bursting out whatever I felt, I was able to respond. And the respond was my choice. A lot of things also have to do with our identity. Whenever we have a conflict, a conversation, there's three layers of that conversation, especially when this conversation is difficult. So there's this layer of what are you talking about? And then there's this layer of what are my feelings about it? But there's another layer, and we very often don't even recognize that layer. And that layer is a layer of identity, my identity. So when I have a conflict with someone, 
In the background, there is this layer of, am I worthy of respect and love? Am I good enough? Does that person respect me? And these are the things that trigger us. You know, if someone annoys us, usually what is at stake is my own identity. It's not so much what the person says or so. It's what it causes within inside of me. And so one of the things that I understood whenever I'm angry about someone, it's actually just something that's going on with me. It doesn't have to do with that person at all. So then I would say, yeah, no, no, but this person is really mean. But in the end, again, when I looked really honestly into myself, I was like, no, it's that person. It's not that person, sorry. It's me. So a lot of people have that question, am I enough? And it's actually such a substantial question. And we, most of the time, we think we are not. A lot of humans think we are not enough. What we are doing is not enough. We're not as good as everyone else. The other person does something better than us or has studied more or has more titles or has uh, a membership somewhere. And that's something where we start to separate ourselves from others. We do this first, not the others. We separate ourselves from others all the time. And the other thing is, I should be grateful. So sometimes when we need something or we want to express something, we feel like, no, 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 I should be grateful for what is there. So I can't just say it, you know, or I can't just offend someone because I should be grateful that I'm here. Or in business, very often people stay in their jobs. They don't like them and they don't appreciate them, but they say, I should be grateful because I earn money. Another like, sentence that always comes um, into our minds is, there's nothing I can do to change this situation. And in businesses, very often that people say, this is the structure, we can't do anything. In politics, we say that as well. So we have that in our mind that I can't change anything. And another thing that I experience again and again in the business world is that people say, my feelings have no space in this world because feelings are not part of business. We are analytical and I think it's a very similar in every you know, academic area that we feel like it's not about feelings. Don't I have okay, I'm running out of time, but we're gonna take that time. So the question is really how can I show up as a whole person. And why can't I not put my feelings into everything I do? Why should my heart not be, be part of this? And I want to introduce you one program that uh, we developed at Google, but it's in the meanwhile an NGO working globally to spread this program. It's called Search Inside Yourself. And it combines emotional intelligence, mindfulness, and science. And the really interesting thing is, emotional intelligence is something that is part of everything that we're doing, but is highly underrated. Because we always think about when we study or do anything, IQ is the important thing and knowledge. So that's what we are trained, at least in the Western world, we need to have a lot of knowledge. So everything that has to do with emotions and heart doesn't make sense in this context. But studies show again and again that the emotional competence is actually the, the competency we need to actually make high-level decisions. And these decisions uh, are much better than the ones we would do without our emotions. And so what is really interesting as well is what we see in the brain. So when we go into emotional intelligence, and this can also be seen not only in a personal level, but also on an organizational level. It starts with self-awareness. So the exercise we did at the beginning, self-awareness, knowing what's going on within ourselves. But then it goes to managing ourselves. And then it goes to social awareness. So the moment we start knowing how to manage ourselves, we understand how we can work with others, relate to others, and also how to manage a conflict. 
And we do it not from the area of, okay, I need to solve this conflict, but we do it from a mutual understanding that we are all the same. And I just want to show it also to you um, on a more scientific level because it's really interesting what's happening in the brain. So you see the front, the, the front part of the brain. It's the thinking brain, the prefrontal cortex. And then there's the limbic system and also the amygdala. And the amygdala is the emotional part of our brain. And what usually happens when we get really triggered, let's say we have a very powerful emotion, there comes a signal, first of all, into our emotional part of the brain. And what it does, without our thinking doesn't know anything yet, it doesn't know we are angry yet, it sends signal into our nerve system. And these signals go into our whole body. And only minutes or seconds later, our thinking brain gets the information. And that's maybe sometimes much too late because we have already screamed or had a reaction that we didn't want to have. But because our thinking brain is not directly connected, the first reaction is our body. So that's why we say mindfulness and self-awareness can really help you because you understand what is subconsciously happening when you have your first emotional reaction. And also developing these qualities of emotional intelligence help you to connect the thinking brain, the prefrontal cortex, with the emotional brain. So it goes a little bit into like what is the purpose of people and what are the values and the visions. But it also goes into our life purpose and finding that, again, is a quest that works inside gives us a shift from I to we. That's another thing. If we really want to have peace, I have to not only think about myself, but I have to think about everyone. And I have to develop that quality saying, everyone deserves to be happy, just like me. And one of the exercises we've been doing with business people all over the world is a meditation that's called Just Like Me. And it's really wonderful and um, you can try it out maybe today throughout the conference. Just whoever you talk to, think in your head, this person is just like me. This person wants to be happy just like me. This person has in his or her life experienced pain or suffering, just like me. This person has in his or her life had any like pain, was trying to be happy but didn't make it, was sad, was crying, just like me. This person was laughing, just like me. And I've been practicing this, this for a while, and what is really interesting about it is the more I practice it, the more I feel it. Because another really interesting thing about our brain is the more we cultivate something in our brain and repeat it again and again, then this habit becomes our behavior. And then this, at one point, this behavior becomes who we really are. Thank you. Thank you, Munira, for that illustrious uh, uh, scientific presentation of how we have the feelings in the mind, particularly in amygdala. In true sense, the feelings come from the chemical transmitters and the electrical transmitters in amygdala, and nobody has understood in the world so far why the transmitters change by little change in the radical, the emotion change, and the scientists are working on it still today. That's the truth, but nobody has understood why the chemical tra transmitters in amygdala change from one side to other side and the emotional reaction of a person varies. It's still in process of, uh, I would say, something which is a qu uh, big query in front of the human being. Thank you so much for the illustrious presentation.